G'day and welcome back to our continuing series on off-highway vehicle design. Today we're going to talk about one of the most difficult applications. Most difficult because it has to consider a vehicle design to actually be two different types of vehicles in one object. So we're going to be talking about amphibians. This is a very large topic, so the video might be a little longer than usual. But, well, it's a complex subject. I've harped on, throughout these videos, on understanding the application. And here it is crucial, because we have multiple applications in one. Amphibian vehicles have to be a boat, and they have to be a truck. Or maybe a bus and then there's the areas in between when they're neither you really need to understand the subject replacement amphibians is a, a bit of a hot topic in Australia at the moment the army is replacing a lot of landing craft and there's a project going for a replacement of its Lark 5 amphibians I think the Australian Army and the US Marine Corps are probably the last military operators of a Lark 5. Those vehicles date from the 1950s and there hasn't been a reasonable replacement since. So people are looking for a viable replacement. And that's probably the theme we're going to focus on mostly in this video. But first, as usual, terminology. And to me, an amphibian is something that lives on the water and on the land. It's not a landing craft. Landing craft come and beach themselves, but they do not drive across the ground. If you're a Navy person, you might, uh, you might think putting a truck on a landing craft is equal to an amphibian vehicle, but you're wasting payload and you're wasting mobility. And I'm going to focus on more the logistics vehicle side of things rather than fighting vehicles. The same rules apply. Um, fighting vehicles generally end up being a fairly crappy amphibian with very small freeboard. Um, they're done for a particular purpose, a very specific purpose, and um, not much good outside of that. Amphibians in general make bad boats and bad trucks. So the whole design is about making them the best possible compromise. Engineering is always a compromise. This is a prime example. Most amphibians are done for military applications. So we'll stick to that theme today too. And amphibians have been around a long, long time. This is a rather poor photo but it's from 1912, I think. And it's a Christie amphibious tank. Christie was a guy responsible for developing a lot of suspension ideas for tanks. He was so good, the Russians used him when the Americans didn't. But his designs have ended up in a lot of different uh, uh, vehicles, particularly tanks. And this is one of his early designs. But you can see it coming out of the river here. Now another focus for today will be open water amphibians. A lot of amphibians are done for riverine environments and that's because World War Three was expected to be fought in Europe where there are a lot of water bodies to cross. So hopefully that never comes to pass. 
and but we'll look primarily at open water uh, i.e things that go out to sea so the vehicle that everybody seems to be familiar with is a duck it's a modified six by six truck it was done in short time and done very well for what it is there's still a number of them running today in a tourist bus applications as you know, probably it's a World War II development, which is really where amphibians came to the fore. But it wasn't just ducks, there were also seeps. This is a sea-going jeep, hence seep. Not too many of them around, um, but again, for crossing rivers. For the Pacific campaign, Alligators and buffaloes were used in a variety of configurations with and without guns as load carriers, as personnel transporters. These were invaluable in the Pacific War, particularly because they could cross coral reefs without damage. And if you remember them from our video on crawlers, you'll remember seeing that the track shoes were specifically shaped to act as scoops for the water. The British also had a go, and this is a terrapin. It uh, wasn't all that successful, and it was fairly late in the war, so it didn't see much action. Not particularly a great design, mechanically or for the application, because there wasn't much room to carry load, and it couldn't be a very physically big load. Post-World War II, there was an enormous amount of work done on amphibians, because the need for them had been recognised. So throughout the 50s and a little bit further on, there was massive amounts of research primarily done in the US. There's a range of vehicles here and I want to introduce them all because it's important to, all, to understand that the vehicles that are in service now didn't just happen. There was a heck of a lot of research and development done to optimise them. So we'll start by looking at a Lark 5, a lighter amphibious resupply cargo, and the V on the end of it is a Roman 5 for 5 short tonne capacity. Yeah. And I just happen to have one with me. I guess 50s used in Vietnam, uh, the word is that they sunk uh, hundreds of them offshore at the end of the Vietnam War. Um, Australian Army still using them. One of the key criteria for this is it's surf capable, hence the shape of the bow, but also provides, let me get this in frame, a very large load area, even though it is nominally rated at five short ton. Sorry, five short ton. But that wasn't the only Lark. This is a Lark 15. Same designator, lighter, amphibious resupply cargo, 15 short ton. It's a much bigger vehicle. Here's a prettier picture. So this is still follows the same nomenclature with Roman numerals. It's written L-A-R-C dash XV for Lark 15. Uh, it's physically a wider vehicle, not widely used. The, uh, it has in more modern times seen a reasonable amount of use in Pacific Islands for island hopping. Uh, not a great deal of information available on how it was employed in the military. And then we get to this monster. This is a, uh, <laughs> this is a Lark 60, as you can see on the side. LX60. Still a lighter. This is carrying a full-blown concrete mixer. That's obviously not a military photo. These things were primarily utilized in Vietnam for bringing stores ashore from offshore ships. They're huge. That might give you another view of it and a better understanding of the size. This is a ramp that unfolds and comes down so you can drive straight in. A monster. And this rather poor photo puts it beside a duck, makes the duck look like a toy. 
So that's the Lark 60. So if the duck was successful, something bigger than a duck could also be successful, particularly if you also gave it a sort of marine name. So this is the XM148 Gull. And I think from memory it only did a couple of prototypes. It's um, essentially fiberglass hull from memory. And then of course, if six wheels worked, well, eight wheels just had to be better. So this is the XM157 Drake. Not a duck, it's a Drake. And then we get all sexy. An LVHX1. Now, it's not immediately obvious, but this big arm here rotates down and makes this into a hydrofoil. And here it is at speed. LVHX1. And then, of course, you can always make a hydrofoil better and faster. So here we are with the LVHX2. Uh, similar design, notice the retracted wheels. This thing could squat down on its suspension and do all sorts of amazing things. And at the time, it got a fair bit of, uh, a fair bit of publicity from memory. It was also turbine powered. So, very fast vessel. So since your army, anything wheels can do, tracks can do better. So here is the LVT. UX2, a damn big tracked uh, amphibian with a ramp. And this is the only shot I could get of this one. This is the LVW, W for wheeled, LVW X1. It is interesting to look at the hull shape, which is removed here, and the wheel wells are swept back for some sort of streamlining. And of course, if the duck can do a good job, then so can a super duck, the XM147. And here it is in a museum. Not a great deal of information available about it either, but it was a purpose-built unit, whereas the original duck was a repurposed truck. And then there's this beast. Of all things, they called it the honey bear. That there's got to be the all-time record most unmilitary name but it's the XM571 so that's a quick overview of the work that was done in the 50s and some in the 60s you'll see the extent of it and there's masses of papers and technology and research and tank trials and so forth that back all that up the upshot of it all was the Lark series so after all of that massive research of hydrofoils and gas turbines and everything, a Lark turned out to be the solution. A Lark 5, 15 and 60. Now that 60 is also sometimes called a Bark, a barge amphibious resupply cargo. In recent times, there's been a few aborted attempts in the US military to restart amphibian development, but there has been one interesting American design. I don't quite know how they pronounce this, but it's the UHAC. It has crawler tracks made of flotation panels. And apparently it works quite well. I've seen the videos. It's intended to carry very heavy loads, but it's a slower speed. Just to be a little more thorough, for rivers, there are things like the EWK M2 and M3 alligators bridging bridging vessels um, and here you can see three of them uh, connected to make a bridge they're still in service today EWK who developed them also did a number of other things and this is a bison um, but as you can see it's amphibious with some inflatable pontoons um, but it's suitable for riverine environments only and there's also the UK's Alva Stalwart, the old Stolly, um, very amphibious, primarily designed for river applications in Europe, but it was used in places like Norway to uh, access offshore uh, islands. 
There's also been an array of, I'll say, recreational vehicles uh, produced um, in the last few decades from tourist buses for rivers and cities. Um, and uh, Gibbs have done uh, a number of aquata type uh, developments for cars and quad bikes, but nothing much to carry big loads. Now, to give a military background to this, I'm not military, but I am a student of, of military vehicles. At the time the Larks were developed, they were called lighters. And that was because at the end of World War II, it was realised that if they kept all their ships close in together, perhaps near a port, one atomic bomb could wipe out the lot. So they had to be dispersed. And that meant the, uh, they couldn't unload out a port or a wharf. So hence they needed lighters. Now a lighter is a, a vessel that goes alongside a ship and the load is transferred to the lighter, which then brings it ashore. With the ships dispersed, that meant landing craft in particular had to be high speed. And that's where the US military in recent decades has been focused in high speed because they needed to get attack landing craft to shore quickly. But then things changed again. And now there's so many ship killing missiles, drones and so forth that it really doesn't matter whether your ships are close in or not. And I think that's the reason the requirements for high speed landing craft uh, in the US has uh, has changed. And we're back now to looking at just how to get uh, stores ashore on unprepared shores. So let's talk a little bit more about the application. Lots of photos of larks have them coming ashore on beautiful sandy beaches. Couldn't be an easier application. You know, <laughs> Didn't have to be a special vehicle to get washed ashore. And of course, returning to the sea can be a little harder. Um, if there are some amphibian videos online that um, show some pretty exciting times going out through the surf. But a lot of photos and expectation is that amphibians come ashore on beaches like this. Obviously, it's an Australian beach, lots of sand bit different if it's UK, a um, bit different if it's Antarctic where these things are still used. But Northern Australia gets uh, 40 foot tides and that leaves miles of mud flat. So is that going to be part of the application? What happens at low tide? You know, high tide is only there for a short period. And you may still not be able to get ashore at high tide if it's a shelving, muddy approach. And then let's talk about working in rivers. Rivers have riverbanks. How the hell do you get up a riverbank? They're not normally nice and shelving like this one. So some amphibians, like this UK combat engineering tractor, actually have rocket-powered anchors to take out a winch rope to help them get up the riverbank. These are being phased out now, but that sort of application problem still exists. The hardest thing for an amphibian to do is to come ashore. We also need to think about, is it still a lighter? Does it have to maintain position next to a capital ship? Position maintaining takes extra effort and extra design. You might need a bow thruster, for example. These things have to be considered. And then we get to the hull form. Hmm. Well, the recent work that I've been involved in for the Australian Army, uh, to satisfy their requirement, has indicated that the hull form of the Lark 5 which is not quite a V, it's sort of a rounded V, is still the best hull form for penetrating surf. So if you're going to penetrate surf, well, how big a damn surf is it going to be? It needs to be considered. 
one of the problems I've had in civilian amphibians. Well, let's get this here. That is the gunnel. That's at the point where the water would start to lap over the hull. The requirement for civilian amphibians is that there's quite a gap there. And the issue is further compounded if the weight is off, off centre or the vehicles. If it's a tourist bus, if everybody rushes to one side of the vessel and it tilts, you lose the gunnel height. This is one of the points where a military amphibian may need to be different to a civilian amphibian. I got involved in amphibians supporting a, a tourist bus that operated in Sydney Harbour. And one of the early problems with it is that it pulled the steering box straight out of the hull. I've no doubt the naval architect had done a great job designing the hull form. What didn't seem to be appreciated was as a vehicle, there would be a number of high point loads and the steering box was one of them. It didn't just rip the steering box out, it took the bracket out and a section of the hull about a foot across. Um, that's when you th you're very glad you've got big bilge pumps. So the point with that is that amphibians aren't just boats. You can't just design the hull as if it was a boat. So a naval architect will get very concerned about the amount of drag. On a lark, I say it's got three bow waves. It's got one from the bow, it's got one from the front wheels, one from the rear wheels. And you can actually see them go off uh, from the, the lark as it's traversing the, the water. So that's, in round numbers, three times the amount of drag, straight up. Retracting the wheels, which is done on a lot of those experimental vessels, helps reduce the drag. But it produces side effects. It very much complicates the vehicle, the mechanics of the vehicle, and it also means that this wheel well has to be much bigger. And that's buoyancy. You start taking away bits of hull, you're losing buoyancy and payload. So again, it's a compromise. Do you want maximum payload or do you want maximum speed and efficiency in the water. And no, you can't have both. Similar problems occur when we talk about the waterborne drive. Is it props? Is it jets? What is it? This sort of vessel for a, a, a wheel vehicle, the wheels are not sufficient. If it was tracked, yes, maybe the tracks themselves would be sufficient, but certainly won't get you high speed and may not be suitable for surf. The original Lark was prop driven and I'm going to try and show that to you. There's a prop. Back in here, a shielded prop. And that works really good. But, and there's always a but, what happens when it's full of seaweed or you're in a river and there's lots of reeds and rushes? Propellers don't like that. You can get it clogged. And I believe there's also a maintenance nightmare that somewhere in there, well, somewhere in there is a bearing that has to be lubricated every half hour. So, yes, that would be a job for the most junior, <laughs> most junior soldier to crawl under this wet, perhaps muddy, sandy vessel with a grease gun every half hour. Yeah, I really expect that happens. So props work well, um, but they have a downside. Reeds and rushes and seaweed are maybe a problem, but the other thing is clearly visible here. That prop has a very large duct. That probably costs this vehicle a ton in payload at least because that's water, this hull is not displacing. So again, props are simple, they're a known thing, but you lose buoyancy and payload with them.
and maybe you've got a reed rush and seaweed problem. So if you don't like props, you can use water jets. And that would probably be the logical solution these days. Water jets provide good thrust, steering, and they're reversible. And they require less hull cutout, so you get a bit more buoyancy. And it's for those reasons they were used on the first vehicle, first amphibian, I had to work on. This is the Aussie Duck that ran in Sydney Harbour. It was a modified lark, it had been cut down the middle. And it used pontoons to come down the side to give it the stability. You'll see very high windows because that's um, the gunnel. If everybody rushed to one side, we had to have a gunnel height sufficient to meet civilian requirements. All of these windows were plastic and the idea was they would blow out if uh, they got hit with a strong wind um, and hence we could still keep the gunnel height. If they weren't blow out windows we would have needed a much higher gunnel height. But this unit used pump, uh, water jets and they work very well but with one big downside. They are susceptible to plastic shopping bags blocking the inlet. So on the Aussie duck, the intake ducts had a pipe going up from them and if ever they were clogged with shopping bags there was a broomstick on board to push down that pipe and dislodge the shopping bag. It's a vulnerability they have. Hopefully plastic shopping bags in the water is a decreasing problem, but something you need to be aware of. I'm not sure. My understanding is that water jets work better in reeds and rushes too, but I'm sure they could still be clogged somehow if you tried hard enough. Next alternative is my personal favourite, and it would be a pump jet. And if you're a naval architect, you'll shake your head in horror because you think they're slightly less efficient. The whole vessel is a study in inefficiency individually, uh, but it should be a study in maximising compromise. There's a very good reason, probably two very good reasons, I'm going to suggest pump jets. But first, let's have a look at them. This is a pump jet. In fact, it's a steerable pump jet. The water comes in the bottom and squirted outside and the whole body can rotate. The reason I like them is this. There's no big cutout in the hull. There's very little buoyancy lost because of them. And the ground clearance isn't terribly impacted either. So... Oh, and the other thing, if you're station keeping beside a capital ship, a steerable pump jet is probably going to give you a lot more controllability. But the options don't stop there. I'm going to give you another, albeit weird one, but it is a viable solution for particular applications. And this is a screwdriver. This uh, vessel, it's a Zill something. A Zill 2906 is used to, as part of a system to recover down space capsules. So if the capsule came down in swampland or marshes or whatever, this vessel could go in and retrieve the crew. This is not the only time this sort of drive has been used. It's primarily for marshes, but it works in water as well. But I wouldn't use it going down the highway. So that's an overview of some of the options for driving the vessel in the water. But you also need to drive it on land. And you also need to drive it when it's between the two. That's where things get tricky. You can use hydraulics to drive your marine drives. It's not perhaps the most efficient way, but it can be done. Traditionally, prop shafts are used, but 
particularly a four-wheel drive vessel, is going to have an awful lot of prop shafts in the in the hull already. So let's assume you're going to have a four-wheel drive amphibian. Let's look at some of the drive line problems that you're going to have to solve. And to do that, I'm going to look at a Lark, which a Lark 5 actually, which has an interesting drive line. There's a T box there which goes to another T box which goes to an angle drive with a wheel there up to an angle drive here with another wheel there and the same on the other side T boxes and angle boxes everywhere it's what's called a H configuration the only differential on a Lark 5 is in here and that's fine for on the beach where any misalignment in torques or speeds can be just taken out in wheel slippage. When you get on the highway it's a real problem because if these wheels are steered as they are and these wheel, wheels aren't, these wheels need to go further than that one. particularly. If you're turning left, this wheel's got to go a lot further than that. So what makes up the difference? The chances are you're going to break diffs running this on a highway, on hard sealed surfaces. If your amphibian's going to run on hard standing, then you need a better differential arrangement. You need one for each axle and possibly one in the middle. So when you're designing it, you need to be very certain as to whether you're going to be designing for the beach or mud or on hard standing or both the situation the design will change depending on that decision and if it's military and they say it'll only ever be off the road and in the bush or the mud or the sand or whatever ask them if their military bases have paved roads and if their maintenance workshops are hard standing the answer would be yes sooner or later these vehicles will be on hard standing and you don't want to break differentials tires are also an issue we need to think about are we operating in sand or mud or grass or river banks or running down the freeway that's a decision that comes out of the application and in military most of these sort of vehicles would do most of their kilometres on normal civilian roads. And for the tyres, you're probably going to need CTIS, a central tyre inflation system, so the driver can readily switch from one position, one mode to another, and dump the air pressure out to, to run on sand and up the air pressure to run on highway. Moving inboard, the next decision is brakes. What sort of brakes? Well, everybody would want normal disc brakes, but if you put them in the usual place, they're going to be out in the seawater. Not good. If you put them inboard, mounted on diffs, then they're going to be in the oily bilge water. Again, not good. No simple solution here. One solution could be fully enclosed wet disc brakes and that would take away the problem with seawater and bilge water and so forth but if you're planning on running at say 30 kilometers an hour or more they're not going to cope with that heat and then probably the biggest decision you'll have to make does this vehicle have a suspension or not on a Lark 5 the suspension is just the tyres and that causes problem on hard stands because it's very easy to lift a wheel. No bit of concrete is flat. Your loads are going to shift from one wheel to the other. And if you're unloading steering wheels, then you're going to have a steering problem as well. But if you do fit suspension and perhaps you're fitting wheel retraction with it, you're going to need bigger wheel wells. And what does that mean? it means less payload because you've just taken buoyancy away because you've removed hull that would have otherwise been in the in the water 
So there's massive trade off there. EWK solved this problem with their bridging amphibians by putting the axle completely outside the hull and just driving it, having a prop shaft through to it. But that would have cost them tons of buoyancy because this is great big cutout where the axle sits. Now if you're going to do perhaps um, an independent suspension with the diff mounted inside the hull and the wheels mounted outside, then you've got to get a drive shaft out through that hull and the drive shaft is going to move up and down with the suspension. So that's not an easy joint to seal. Hydraulic drive can remove many of these problems, but it also means your hydraulic components are out in the water and hoses and so forth may be susceptible to damage as you come ashore and you may have a problem with environmental concerns if you've had an oil leak. So boats are more stable when they're wider and trucks are more stable when they're wider. But there are limitations and it's called the lane width on your roads. If you have to meet civilian lane width requirements in Australia, you're about 2.4 metres wide. Lark 5 has federal approval to run wider than that because it can't be reduced in width. Civilian amphibians have been using pontoons and so forth to be narrow on highway and wide in the water. Pontoons, yeah, they work. They're complex. They're annoying. They're unreliable because they're running in salt water. Not so much the pontoons, but all the sensors and locking mechanisms to make sure it's all working properly. So width is an issue. And hopefully if you're doing a military job, the military has had the courage to go to civilian authorities and tell them to demand that they permit a wider vehicle. Now let's talk about some operational issues with amphibians. It's really easy for an amphibian to get into the water. You can fall into a swimming pool, you can fall into a river, you can fall into the surf, really easy. But it's hard to climb back out of a swimming pool. You need to brace yourself, lift yourself up, get a leg over the edge and out. It's much harder than falling in. And the same thing happens with amphibians. The British Army, with their combat engineering tractor, were forced to use a rocket-assisted anchor for a winch to get that tractor out of riverbanks. Now, they were focused on riverbanks, and a lot of riverbanks are quite steep. Less of an issue if you're talking about ocean shores, but it can still be a problem. So coming ashore on a beach, whether it's in surf or not, is relatively easy. And it doesn't really matter too much what the wheels and props are doing. You can have both running, you can just run the props until you're well onto the, the sand and then turn to wheels and drive out. It's an easy easy fix. Coming ashore on a boat ramp you would think would be fairly easy too. Same deal, surely. It's a boat ramp, it's probably concrete and simple. Yeah, but what happens if that boat ramp is at 90 degrees on a river or a bit of tidal area with the tide and current running hard? You're going to want a lot of power to your props to keep you lined up with the boat ramp. And in most amphibians, you would have the wheels engaged at the same time, albeit maybe in first. Lots of revs, lots of power to props means lots of revs to wheels. And then you hit the boat ramp and everything goes kaboom with a big shock load. Particularly if it's a concrete boat ramp, it's low tide and there's a drop off at the end of the ramp and you've just hit that edge with your wheels. Your wheels that are spinning quite fast. Coming ashore is definitely the hardest thing to do right. There's also the situation where you're driving, let's say down a river, and it might be low tide or there's maybe not much water in the river, 
and your wheels are in contact, then they're not, then you're floating, then you're not. You can't be switching from prop to wheels, prop to wheels and so forth all the time. You have to be able to drive both at the same time. So there's multiple different modes that an amphibian must go through. It's not just in the water or on the land. It's going to and from that you must consider, particularly if you're in that nether region of not quite floating but not quite driving on the wheels. You need to think seriously about your transmissions. Some of this is similar to pump and roll on a airport crash truck where big crash trucks with single engines need power to drive the wheels so they can drive around the crash site at the same time they're pulling power to drive the pumps. Pump and roll is very expensive to fit so you need to think very carefully about what drivetrain you're going to put in an amphibian. In terms of stability Generally, you want to keep the center of gravity, whether laden or unladen, in the middle, between the wheels and on the center line of the vehicle, uh, so that irrespective on land or on water, you're still as stable as you're going to be. Electrics are always a problem because of the salt water. You're going to have to do special things to make sure they're surviving, that they're protected, and that particularly relates to headlights. Headlights are required for road, but there's specifications as to how far above the road surface they can be. At those heights, they're generally underwater on an amphibian. So you're going to have underwater headlights that you're going to need to protect. And I want to talk about bilge pumps. I've had the situation where the operator drained the bilges, forgot to put the plugs in, and took a group of tourists out on the harbour. Fortunately, nobody noticed until the unit was back on shore and bleeding massive amounts of water out of its bilges. It was at that point we realised that the water level had been very, very high. In fact, the tide marks inside the hull were higher than the engine intakes. So I'm, I don't know how they managed not to seize the engines. My preference with bilge pumps is one small electric one that's on all the time that the engine is running. Now, you have to be careful what sort of pump you select for that because... Some pumps don't like running dry, but it works well just to clean up any water that's hanging around. It works well until some mechanic has left an oily rag in the bilge that clogs the intake. If you take in more water than that, you need an electrically powered pump that's more substantial. And that probably means it needs to be float activated. So the water level gets to a certain height, the pump turns on and the driver gets an indicator that he's got a problem or he's heading towards a problem and he needs to be aware of it. Ultimately, you need a monster pump, probably hydraulically driven, and one that's just going to pump massive amounts of water out of the bilges and keep you afloat. And that's in case you've left the bilge plugs out or you have a hole crack or you've ripped the steering box out and taking part of the hull with it, and you're in taking in large amounts of water. That case, you know, lights, sirens, big red button for the driver to hit, and head to the nearest boat ramp to get the vessel out of the water. And crew. Crew are the biggest advantage and can be the biggest disadvantage of running an amphibian. In a civilian world, it, the driver, the operator, needs to be a truck driver and a coxswain. And it's rare to find those two in one people. You obviously don't want to use two people. 
and that can lead to problems that they're rare and they know they're rare and perhaps they're not the easiest to deal with. In a military world, I suspect it's a little different. And my pet beef is toilets. If you're doing a tourist bus, you're probably going to have to have a toilet because your incoming Japanese tourists expect to have all mod cons in every circumstance. They're not easy. When you're on the water, the wastes need to be macerated and sterilised and then ejected to the water. When you're off the water, they need to be collected so that next time they go on the water, they can be macerated and sterilised and ejected. It's a pollution thing, an environmental thing. You're probably going to need a very special toilet and lots of control systems. My experience is <clears throat> they're a real pain. So that's the end of my deep dive into, uh, and no pun intended, into amphibians. They are the ultimate in compromise. Absolutely need to know the application, the real application, not just what people tell you it is. You need to be, you need to be careful that the design part segment you're working on matches the overall strategic requirement. And this is a warning for naval architects as well. They're not designing a boat. It's a vehicle. So there's enough difference from a boat that they can't just assume it's like a boat. Right down to the sort of brakes you fit is affected by the marine application. And as I said, if you put them outboard, you've got problems. You put them inboard, you've got problems. You put no brakes on, you've got problems. So there's, it's a compromise right through. Be very sure that you know your application and that you've, you've actually told people what the trade-offs are so that no one is surprised at the end. And if ever there was a design that cried out for reliability and maintainability, this is it. You, know, you can't pull into a service station while you're, while you're at, on the water. Um, you might be able to get down into the engine bay and fix a few things, but it's very limited. You need something that will be reliable, particularly while you're on the water, and it's maintainable in that you can access parts as and when required. So that's amphibs. They're complicated beasts. They're never the best they can be because it's all compromises. So cover all the compromises, understand them, enunciate them until you're comfortable with what you've done. And then, and very importantly, go have fun because there's a hell of a lot of fun involved, particularly at splashdowns, which Aussie Duck used to do very well so you can be serious while you're designing it but don't forget to have a bit of fun too that's all till next time